unlike the prostate cancer AUA guidelines, the AUA guidelines for stress urinary incontinence are very thin, so I'm gonna have to speak very slowly to <laughs> occupy my 20 minutes. Um, I have a caveat. Uh, everybody in the AUA guidelines are my friends. They're great, they're excellent. I don't like these AUA guidelines, so I, my, my talk is gonna be a little bit biased. I'm gonna tell you exactly the things that I don't like about it. Uh, the main thing is that it's very politically correct, so we include everything and send them. We all can play and do whatever we want, and it's all nice. And I think we do have data to be a little bit stronger instead of the recommendations. Just as a summary, there are three, uh, actually, recommendations in the whole guideline. Everything else is an expert opinion or uh, a, clinical, um, a clinical indication. Three expert opinions, one of which is moderate. So this is the third AUA guideline, and it will discuss three areas, the evaluation, counseling, and follow-up. Uh, data regarding treatment options and algorithm for treatment. As mentioned before, this is a comprehensive literature search by the ECRI between 2005 and 15, and then they included additional abstracts uh, all the way to September 2016. They looked at systemic reviews, randomized controlled trials, controlled clinical trials and observational studies, and they had 420 publications and included about half of them, 256. Now, I know this was presented by Ricardo, but I just don't know if it came through. The level of evidence um, is really unrelated to the recommendation. I mean, they're somewhat related, but they're not exactly the same. Level of evidence uh, really describes where the study came from. So uh, level one, or grade one, is well-conducted RTC with exceptional observational studies. The other one, B, is RTCs and or observational studies with some weaknesses, and grade three, are inconsistent kind of studies with difficult to interpret. Now the recommendations are really based on risk and benefit. So the, the higher the difference between risk and benefit, that's where your recommendation is. So you can have a strong recommendation with a great level three, C. So it's, they don't have to be one-on-one. -on -one. It's not that the good RTCs that are grade A are gonna be a strong recommendation, that really they are somewhat disconnected. They tend to go together, but not necessarily. So strong is if there's substantial risk benefit. So you can show for sure a sling is much better than doing nothing. That's a strong recommendation. You don't need a lot of grade one evidence to show that. So um, moderate is that that difference is shorter, it's closer together. And conditional is that you think there's a benefit, but they're so close that any study might just, an additional study might change that. Clinical principle is really what we think all urologists would widely accept as uh, part of uh, clinical care. And expert opinion is really what those eight people in that room think should happen. So the expert opinion is really based on the people in the panel. All right. So for, uh, for our guidelines in stress urinary incontinence, we define the index patient, and the patient has pure stress urinary incontinence of that have mixed incontinence with predominant stress incontinence. So every, everybody else is not part of these guidelines. There will be mentioned at the end, but they're really not part of these recommendations. Um, the patient would have not had surgery before, so this is their first surgery. And I'm gonna put in yellow all these statements that are in our guidelines from our society that I have no idea what they mean. So you can include low-grade prolapse, um, except they didn't define what low-grade prolapse was because they didn't know, because the studies don't really define it. The non-index patient includes anybody with high uh, stage three prolapse, mixed incontinence that is non-stress predominant, that has a quote-unquote elevated PBR, but there's no measure as to what is elevated. I don't know if that's 100, 200, 500, or 1,000, not there. Anybody who has voiding dysfunction, which again, one of those very catch-all terms, not exactly what it means, but if your patient has voiding dysfunction, not an index patient, this AUA guidelines will apply to them. Prior surgery of stress incontinence, all the other ones are pretty straightforward. Neurogenic bladder, high BMI, mesh complications previously, or anybody older than 65 is not part of this um, index patient. So these guidelines are for women younger than 65 who have pure stress or mixed, um, mixed incontinence with the majority of the symptom is stress and has never had surgery before. So in terms of the guidelines, the first goes to the evaluation. You take a history, then you assess bother. I don't know exactly how. They don't recommend if you do questionnaires, you just ask are you bothered by this or 
Um, yes, I'm bothered or think that's good, you bark it, you did your thing. Physical and pelvic exam, objective demonstration of stress incontinence with a comfortable full bladder. This is what this guidelines drive me nuts. They are SI, um, the, IC, um, the ICS, a lot of societies are really specify how you should examine patients. Half a bladder capacity, 150 cc's, 200 cc's. I mean, it has been very spe uh, specified. So to say that you're gonna um, address if a patient has stress incontinence in or not with a comfortably full bladder, I think it's a little bit lazy part from the, from the panel to put that in those guidelines. You get a PVR, you get a urinalysis, and this is a critical principle. Um, Practitioners should perform additional evaluations in patients with other conditions. Inability to make a diagnosis, that makes sense. So if a patient comes in and it's such a poor historian that no matter how you, what you ask them, they just said, doc, I'm wet, doc, I'm wet. That might be a patient you might want to do something else, you just can't tell. A patient that you think they have stress incontinence, but you can't show it, and you're thinking of some surgical management, then those patients should probably have further evaluation. And this, all these further evaluations are subtle ways to say urodynamics. They don't want to say urodynamics, but that's what they mean. That's what the panel is referring to. Neurogenic dysfunction, or somebody without a normal uh, urinalysis that you will do a cystoscopy. Now, if you can see, they recommend that you do further evaluation in patients with mixed incontinence that is urgency predominant. Well, they shouldn't be on the guideline. The guideline doesn't include that patient. And their teaching is that if they have urge in con uh, predominant incontinence, you deal with the urge. So they shouldn't even be here. But there they are. Elevated PVR per physician judgment. So that could be, again, 100 cc's for me, and it could be 500 for you, and that's cool. You can do your stress incontinence surgery because it's your judgment. Stage, stage three or higher pelvic organ prolapse if stress incontinence not demonstrated with reduction. I would argue why. You know, occult, you, you want, so this goes that you want to uh, diagnose occult incontinence. If you reduce them and you have 200 cc's in the bladder and the patient did not leak, how is having a urodynamic study reduce gonna really improve that outcome. Not a lot. You know, if the patient was empty, but you're not, you should not be uh, examining them empty, then yes. Then you do your damage, you fill the bladder, and you examine them. So again, if they had said at what volume you have to examine them, then this really is not something that needs to be done. And anybody with evidence of significant voiding dysfunction, again, not defined, should have further evaluation. And this is an expert opinion. So this is what the panel in the room thought people should have. Now you may, so those should, you don't have to, you should in these, but you may do it in patients who have OAB. I don't know why. You should do your dynamics or further evaluation of a patient that has OAB. Patients who have failure anti, prior anti-incontinence surgery, I think this is reasonable. You know, somebody else, not you, did surgery, they might have not had uh, a urodynamics or evaluation, now they come to you, they fail, and you don't know why they fail, if it was the wrong surgery, the wrong symptom, the, was it a technical issue, are they obstructed, then yes, this patient should be further evaluated. Prior pelvic organ surgery, I would, again, would argue exactly why. So what, if your patient had a rectal seal 10 years ago and they have incontinence now, do they need a urodynamics? That's a pelvic prior pelvic floor or uh, pelvic prolapse surgery, they don't specify it. I mean, there's some things that make sense and some things that really don't make sense. Again, this is what the panel thought in that room should happen. Uh, cystoscopy is not necessary in the index patient. It's a clinical principle, and I think this is probably the best thing that comes out of this AUA guidelines. Um, physicians may omit urodynamics, so you don't have to do them, but you should or you may, but you don't have to. Uh, and this is a conditional recommendation that is level grade B. I would argue we have good control clinical trials that show that for the index patient, the patient with simple incontinence that you can demonstrate it on physical exam, your dynamics do not stat, does not add anything to your management, doesn't change your management. And we have those studies and we spent a lot of time and money in conducting those studies. So it is very unclear why this was so soft, softly put in the, in the AUA guidelines. Uh, physicians may perform urodynamics in the, in the non-index patient. It's an expert opinion. Um, you should, when you counsel the patient, you should assess how much are they bother. bother. It's, uh, again, part of the panel. It's not really specified what does that mean, but it makes sense. If the patient is not bothered, but they have incontinence, you should counsel them. Maybe they shouldn't do anything. They should observe it. Um, in index patient, this option should discuss, so you should talk to them about observation, doing nothing, pelvic floor exercises, kegels, or working with a physical therapy. Uh, Non-surgical options, which include pessary, 
as well as inserts and surgical intervention, and this is a clinical principle. Uh, patients should be counseled on potential complications, a clinical principle. Prior to selecting a mid-urethral sling, physicians must discuss the alternatives and of treatment and specific risk and benefits of mesh. This is for Dr. Flynn, my argument yesterday. They are specific risk of using mesh, and the guidelines believe that you should actually put yourself aside and say, and if you choose this sling, there's specific um, risk of it, and the most common is mesh extrusion, and it's a clinical principle. Physicians should offer the following treatment. I don't know how many people actually even offer this. I think, in general, the majority of urologists don't offer this, but they, these things exist, and they should be offered. A continence pessary, that's a picture of a continent pessary. It's a pessary that has a little knob. The knob goes under the bladder neck. It occludes it, so you not leak. Vaginal inserts, do people know what vaginal inserts are? Anybody? Okay, three people know what vaginal inserts. Two of them are women. Um, impress. <laughs> So POIS came with a tampon, it's called Impressa, I didn't have a picture, that it has almost like a, 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 um, uh, a curvature in the middle, and again, it's the same thing, it's a tampon that puts pressure in the bladder neck, so patients don't leak. So for women who have very mild incontinence, they can use these things. Um, and these are expert opinion. Physicians should offer any of the following surgical treatment options, and this is why I did my, my, my talk yesterday, we talked about some evidence that th some things are better than others for different groups of patients. Um, Mid-urethral slings, autolox fascial sling, a birch, or bulking agents. So again, we spent the last 10 years to show that slings are superior to birch for the treatment of stress incontinence, but it's okay if you wanna, treat, if you wanna show, offer it to them. Fine, they're better than placebo, so why not offer it? I just don't think it's very useful as a guideline to say, uh, and this is, by the way, we are now more than halfway through the guideline. This is our first recommendation. It's a strong recommendation, has grade level A. Again, what it means is that we have data that shows risk and benefits of doing these therapies. Um, that's all it means. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other, although we do have data that show that a probably a sling is a little bit superior to a bulking agent. But putting that aside, um, in the index patient um, who selects a mid urethral sling, physicians may either offer either the retropubic or transobturator sling. This is a moderate recommendation with strong evidence, again, based mostly on the Thomas trial and other randomized trials that show that they're both good options. Yesterday, I spent time showing that one has better durability, that their um, uh, risks and complications are very different between these two surgeries. That I think that should be discussed with the patient, the benefit and, and um, and risks of this surgery. Patients may be offered single incision slings, um, but must be counseled regarding the immaturity of evidence regarding the efficacy and safety, i.e., you might do it. It's a conditional recommendation, meaning we think it's probably better than doing nothing, but we don't have data. Therefore, it's conditional, because if the studies that are cooking come out and say, you know, they're not very good, then it will not be on our guidelines next time. Um, Treatment, mesh slings should not be placed if the urethra is injured at the time of surgery. This is a clinical principle. I think most of us, you know, we don't have any studies to randomize patients to this. We don't have any evidence, but nobody will ever do those studies. It's kind of one of those clinical principles. Don't put a foreign material if you have a hole in the urethra. And stem cell therapy should not be offered outside clinical trials. This is an expert opinion of people in that panel. I think this is a very reasonable recommendation. In terms of follow-up, physicians and their order designees, uh, so it could be your PA, according to the previous uh, talk, should communicate with patients within early post-operative period, and early is not defined, to assess significant voiding problems, pain, or other anticipated events, and this is what the panel thought um, was reasonable. And they should be examined within six months. I appreciate they put a, de uh, a, a date there. I think a lot of practitioners would feel that you have to see that patient within the first six, uh, three months of surgery. But they put six months, they give us a little wiggle room there to assess the subjective outcome, continence voiding, urinary tract infections, pain, OAB symptoms, sexual function, do a pelvic exam, do a PVR, and this is an expert opinion. Um, they talk at the end of the, of the guidelines about the special cases, a little bit of what I talked yesterday, but with very little data saying, you know, we don't know about many of these things. Uh, the very obese patient, the patient has a recurring continence, all was expert opinion, uh, and I presented that data yesterday. And then they have this nice um, kind of flow algorithm that says, you know, you do your initial evaluation, 
you should do further evaluation in some patients, you might do it in other patients, don't do a systo, and you may or may not do a urodynamics. Um, and then they talk about the treatment options and the special cases. They, at the end of the guideline, they talk about future um, research and future directions, we really working on patient literacy and informed consent process, improve the education of patients regarding the condition and therapeutic options, and especially with quality of life issues, the better inform the patient and the, the patient understands what the expectations are, they tend to be more satisfied regardless of the outcome. Use telemedicine in pelvic floor disorders as an alternative uh, to treatment, so talk about eliminating urologists even more, now we can do it by the phone, and stem cells are maybe a future area of research. So what I think are some of the limitations besides the ones that I've been trying to tell you uh, throughout the talk, they only study FDA-approved interventions, and as you guys know, a lot of, not a lot, but uh, there, there are significant procedures that are not a kit produced by a pharmacy that people use for treating continence, and therefore those are not in our guidelines. Um, some of the interventions, unfortunately, especially of the mid sling, are no longer on the market, but they're part of some of these large clinical trials or large data that were used for the guidelines, but they have been withdrawn because of the mesh controversies that are being withdrawn from the market. Um, the majority of patients we see are not index patients. You know, they're not thin women who have never had surgery, that are younger than 65, who have only stress incontinence. So that's kind of a limitation. And on the contrary to that, the majority of the studies that we have to withdraw the recommendations do not recruit index patients only, you know. So when you look at the literature and you look at the studies, it's a lot of large series who have included everybody who came in and had a sling, and then they do sub-analysis by groups, by, by age, by weight, by other things. But really, the study itself was not designed only for the index patient in mind. It's mostly expert opinion. As I say, there are three recommendations. I do think that we have some good data on aerodynamics that we could say comfortably that the index patient with stress only uh, symptom that you can demonstrate on physical exam with a history that makes sense does not need aerodynamics and should not have aerodynamics. Um, and uh, I think there are some data that we discussed yesterday about some of these special groups that I think they could have gone a little bit more in depth in our guidelines to be helpful. So. In summary, what you can take from the guidelines if you don't want to read them. Don't see the patients. You may or may not do urodynamics. Offer observation, pelvic floor exercises, or surgery. And you can, in surgery, offer bulking agent or anything you want. Was that helpful? Yeah. All right, thank you.